Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Stamola Live, a product of the Stamola Literary Studios. Thank you for joining me today on this really troubling day. I hope that our the presentation today provides us all a little respite from the troubled thoughts that we have. And then when we're done taking a respite, we can go back um, to saving the world, read, donate, participate, and vote. First, I wanna thank everyone at Stamola Literary Studio for this great series they've put together, which is just keeps getting bigger and bigger all the time. Um, and all these great videos and presentations. Um, please check them out and subscribe to the YouTube channel Stamola Live. I want to thank our fearless leader, Rose Stamo, my incomparable agent, Allison Remchek, and the biggest thanks to Erica for all of her help with Stamola Live, as well as Allie and everybody else at Stamola Studios, the agents, um, the writers, and the illustrators. So I'm going to talk today about historical fiction and putting your research for your historical fiction into motion. Um, I hope this will become clear um, as I go along. <clears throat> I'm the author of several books for adults. Um, some of them are nonfiction books that required a ton of research. And I'm also the author of three middle grade novels, um, each of which required a great deal of research. And I've learned a few things along the way I want to pass some of these tips on to you about your research and putting it into motion in your prose. First, why historical fiction? Well, clearly, one thing historical fiction wants to do is to imagine what life was like in the past. Yes, we want to try as best we can to imagine a lost world. But with historical fiction, we also have an opportunity to look at our world today through the lens of history. We can look at what has changed, society and all of its encumbrances, um, uh, customs and architecture and thinking, etc. cetera. Um, but it's also um, what has not changed. Um, it's important that we remember that um, we want to see our character struggles and see our own world today through the lens of history. Historical fiction doesn't want to just be an artifact um, that simply says this is how the past was. I think it's a much more dynamic form than that. So um, now I have to go. Nancy Pelosi is calling me, so I need to go turn her off. <laughs> Usually, I'd be really happy to talk to Nancy. <clears throat> so how do we begin to bring this lost world to life, whatever era we choose? Well, research is a great tool for starting. Um, it's a means to bringing the lost worlds to life, not to inventory to the past, not to just say, there was this and there was this and there was this, but to take all of that sense of the past, all of those objects and details and textures and put them back into motion to make it live again. Some historical, and so this is, this is where I'm going with putting it all into motion. There are a good deal of historical novels, many of which are really fun reads, um, but they have the characters enter a room and then they, the characters stop and the writer stops with them and they detail all of the furniture in the room. They detail the architecture of the room and how the style came about and when it was first introduced. Or they look at the costumes and describe them in great ornate detail. They, look at, they talk about the customs and the histories of the people and this is just from walking into a room and that's what I mean by an inventory. We walk into a room and we get an inventory a static tableau. But this is not what the character or characters are thinking when they enter that room. They're not thinking why that chair's brocade upholstery must have come from Vienna about 30 years ago. No, the character enters the room in a rush thinking, which one of you ruffians stole my wallet? I try to keep all of my research aimed at 
moving through the character rather than sort of placed on the character. So in motion through the characters. It's important to remember about history, for me at least, that it was never static. I always try to keep in mind that the historical era I've set my characters in was in its own time as urgent and complex and as confusing and as dynamic as our own time, our own present. History is not a tableau to be gazed at from afar. It's a whirling rush of forces and characters and activities that and we want to bring the reader into it, into that dynamic motion, rather than just watching a painting of that. The novel that you're writing is the right now of those characters when you're writing historical fiction. And I find that really important to keep in mind, to try and bring some of that urgency, that confusion, that chaos that a world is, and bring it to that historical time, rather than looking at it as simply um, again, a tableau, a museum piece. So I'm going to move on now and talk about some research tips and ways into it. And then I'll go, I'm going to read a few passages from some of my own books, um, trying to show how I put research into motion. I've done a great deal of research for two of my adult novels, The Yellow Lighted Bookshop, which is a history of bookselling, and Blackboard, A Personal History of the Classroom, which is a history of classrooms and teaching. But that's a different kind of research. That's meant to capture and synthesize histories, to find details, to make your points, to trace movements throughout time. In a novel, we're looking for some different texture of history. We are indeed looking for those textures, uh, the taste of a cup of coffee, uh, the way the carriage wheels feel uh, bounding over cobblestones in the street. Um, and so for today, I'm going to focus on uh, my three middle grade novels. Um, and I'll do a little shameless <laughs> uh, promotion here. Um, my first one was Steinbeck's Ghost, uh, which takes place in Salinas. This has the least actual historical um, research, but it did entail some other kinds of research I'll get into in a second. The Haunting of Charles Dickens, which takes place entirely in 1862 in London. This was the most research heavy of the books that I did. Um, a, a world farther away from any world I really know. And then finally, Bridge of Time, which is a time travel book um, where Mark Twain meets some kids from contemporary America who've accidentally shown up in San Francisco in 1864. So that was a combination of kinds of research. Um, so with that in mind, let's go forward and talk about the research. First of all, I think a really important kind of research for your novel is any on-site research that you can do. Um, Steinbeck's Ghost takes place in Salinas and Monterey, which is just a couple hours south of me here in San Francisco. And these are places I've been to my entire life. I know them pretty well. I've, I've spent a lot of time studying Steinbeck down there and just enjoying the beautiful countryside. Um, but still, research was required. The kind of on-site research that I was able to do here. Um, the, the, the first case for me was... Um, um, I needed to know if my main character could ride his bicycle all the way from the eastern side of the Sal of Salinas Valley to the western side of the Salinas Valley. And so I had to drive in a car, because I wasn't riding a bike, and I had to figure out which route he would take and how long it would take and what would be obstacles, etc. So that was a very pointed bit of research that I wanted to do. But while one is doing research on site, and the same is true with book research as well, um, one is capable of being surprised by one see what one sees if one keeps an open mind. And so while looking for this mythical um, uh, housing gated community um, that the main character lived in, I found one on the far east side of Salinas, 
And so we went up there and I was with my wife and my daughter and we were driving around and looking at the place and seeing what the views were like and trying to get that sense of the place, um, what it would be like to live there, what the weather was like, what the sun looked like as it was setting, coming up, etc. Anyway, driving around trying to get this sense of things, my daughter elbows me and she says, Dad, look at all the street signs. And so I looked up at the street signs and the street signs in this gated community were all named after famous literary writers, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Bradbury, etc. That's not research I ended up putting in the book, but it made me feel like I was on the right track. I loved that moment of surprise. Um, you have to be open for that moment of surprise. That's why I use hard copy dictionaries rather than just looking up a word on the internet because I'm often surprised by all the words that I find around that one word I was looking for. So you go in with great intention, but always keep your, your, your mind on, on possible surprises. So that on-site research in Salinas and in Monterey on up in Corral de Tierra was a wonderful time and it really helped me sense what it was like to live in that place. To know that in the afternoons, in the summer, there's a hot wind that's blowing through Salinas every afternoon. It's the heat being pulled back up into the valley, which will eventually bring in the fog. So I get to really feel that and understand that. And that helped me see what my characters might be like living in this place. Now, when it came to London and the haunting of Charles Dickens, I had been to London before, but I wasn't able, to, when writing this book, to visit for any sort of on-site research. But I could go to the Dickens Fair in San Francisco, not to try and replicate or believe that that is what London was like, but to pick up little tiny bits of information from the details that I saw. And one thing that I first noticed was that everywhere, everywhere, there were chalkboards and signboards with writing all over them. And as I did more research into London through illustrations and photographs, I discovered that London itself was a city covered with words. And so I was able to incorporate that and put signboards and signposts everywhere in the novel and try and recreate some sense of what it was like to live there. You were constantly bombarded with advertisements and exhortations. When it came to writing Bridge of Time, I was fortunate in that I was able to do a lot of on-site historical research in contemporary San Francisco. That is, there are historical sites here that I could go and visit and find out more about what life was like there. Again, the sense of the character living in the world, not the history of the world preceding the character. One of the main uh, points of action in Bridge of Time is the Four Point Historical Monument um, underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, which has been around since the 1850s and has been a, and was during the Civil War and during the time of the novel, a, um, an active military battalion. Being able to go there and see things, yes, with the little placards next to them and learning the exact names, that was all terrific. And I took copious notes everywhere I go, everywhere I went. But I would also just walk around in these dark, dank hallways and stand at the top of the fort looking out over the bay and out over the Pacific and try to imagine myself what it was like to be a soldier in that place in that time. Of course, you can also go visit the barracks there, and you get to see the narrow bunk beds, three of the pop um, that the soldiers had to live in, and of course, the much plusher officers' quarters. These kinds of things, details that I might not actually end up using, still informed my sense of what it was like to be alive in 1864 and live in this dank, dark, cold fort. So... When it comes to that, I think you should open up your uh, vista for what might include on-site research for you. Say you cannot go back in time. I understand that's still impossible. Or you can't go to 19th century London. Are there historical sites near you that you can go visit to get a sense of what it was just like to be someone who lived in the 19th century? 
or the 18th century, or for those of you in Europe, or further back. Get that sense of standing in those rooms, standing in those places, surrounded by that objects. Your characters will then begin to exude that sense um, of the real lived life. Um, take notes everywhere you go when you're doing this on-site sort of research. I use one of those thin notebook, uh, journalist reporter notebooks. It's really thin and tall with spiral at the top. You can fold it over and it fits in your back pocket. It's great for taking notes on. Take lots and lots of notes as you go through, but don't forget to raise your head up and look around and see that dark spot in the corner or that shaft of light coming through this gallery window over here that might indicate to you something about life in that time. In short, wander where you can and where you will. I love on-site research, but clearly historical novels ask you to do a lot of literary research, that is, to read a lot of books. I typically spend about six months just doing research and taking notes in a notepad um, before I begin to write the actual novel. And I'll try and explain how that process works for me a little bit. And so your question is, first then, where do you start with this research? This is the most solid piece of information I'll give you today. In the 1980s, there was a film critic named Gene Shalit, who used to be on the Today Show. And every Christmas, Gene, he was really well known. He had big curly hair and a big old mustache and flashy bow ties. And he was sort of a slightly outrageous character. But at Christmas time, Gene Shalit would always do a roundup of books that were coming out that, that particular Christmas. And during one episode in the late 80s, he was talking about some books that were coming out and he made this really interesting observation, which I've tried to hew to since then. He said, when you are just beginning to learn about a subject, when you are just beginning your book research for a subject, start with a really good kid's book. There's the eyewitness books from Darling Kindersley. There's any number of great nonfiction books that are perfect for kids and perfect for adults. It's a way of looking at a subject in its larger shapes so you can begin to grasp the big picture before you delve into all the details. For instance, if you needed to learn something about how to write about architecture, you might get the eyewitness book on architecture and get a really wonderful yet detailed overview in 64 or 80 pages um, about architecture or printing or weaponry, or you name it, you can find a really good kid's book. Don't start with the 3,000 page, two volume, complete history of world architecture. Start with a good kid's book. Get that general outline there. Make that something that begins to paint the picture for you. And then knowing the broader outlines, you can then sort of focus your attention, your research attention on what aspects you need to get more detailed about. Anyway, that's your hot tip for the day. Always start with a good kid's book. And then of course, you're gonna read more books and you're gonna read as much as you can. Um, but I don't want you to only go to the history book. For instance, writing about London in 1862, I read all sorts of other materials related to London, not just the history of London. Um, I read almanacs, I read digests, I read newspapers from the time. I tried to poke around in the corners where I could see life really happening for people, not a narrative that an historian had put together. Um, this is really fun kind of research. And I want to um, emphasize that when you go to your local library, um, make use of those reference librarians there who know exactly what you're looking for. They can save you a lot of time. Um, open up your scope of what might be possible research for you. Um, 
I think you'll find more surprises, more textures by looking at it through different writers and, and different authors. Um, and then you read as much as you can. That's as plain and simple as that. Um, I take notes on my research in a little note, in a big notebook uh, while I'm actually writing. Um, that helps me keep the key things um, together. I also keep a really good bibliography of what I read in case I need to go back and re-research at some point. When it comes to reading literature about the period, I want to recommend that you go to literature from the period. In other words, when I was reading when I was researching Dickens, I read a ton of Dickens, and I, which was no harm, no foul, that was so great. I read a ton of Dickens, but I read a lot of other contemporary writers, um, writers who were contemporary to Dickens. I, because I want to get as close to their actual language, as a close to their actual ways of thought, um, as opposed to a secondary source. So you might be a 19th century, but by a 21st century writer. Probably not that bad, but you're at a remove from the original source. I know that when I write my novel, it's going to be at least one remove from Dickens, um, one remove from that society. But if I'm looking to um, a contemporary of mine, um, or even someone from the 20th century, um, as a source for that language and that material, then I'm already at two removes. I'm they're removed once from Dickens, and now I'm removed once from them. Go to the literature from the time, and this also includes all of the sort of ephemera, newspapers, editorials, magazine articles, etc. Stick as close as you can to that authentic language of that time. That one, Dickens is an example. One of the great things about Dickens is that, to my eye, he's not this old fashioned writer, that he's this dynamic, urgent, compelling writer who can't wait to get into the streets of London and tell the stories that are happening now. So if I get to Dickens authentically, directly through him, I'm getting more of that charge, more of that electricity. If I'm coming to somebody at a later date, again, there's, there's too many removes for me there. Be a little leery of that. You would then be basically writing a book about a book. Okay. Um, now, I know from my own historical fiction writing. Um, um, oh, sorry, I got lost in my notes. I didn't lose my train of thought. I lost my pogo stick of thought. Let me begin again. Um, now, when you're in the library, really look around for almanacs, digests, overviews, any weird, and a lot of it will be on microfiche. Um, and it's great to do that in the library and really get your hands on it because you have to sort of focus on it while you're doing it um, instead of jumping over and checking your Facebook and coming back for a second. But almanacs, digests, anything that talks about the news or the fashions or the habits that cover that particular time from that particular time um, is going to teach you so much about the world. Almanacs, for instance. Um, you can learn about the weather, um, the extremes of the weather in this place in this time, um, and the regularities of the weather in this place in this time. Interestingly, when it comes to Dickens, um, there's so much snow in Dickens' novels. Um, we certainly think of that when we think of Dickens, the snow-capped, um, tall, thin roofs of London. Um, but that's because there was a small, there was a tiny ice age that swept over Europe in the first half of the 19th century. Things were a little bit colder then. Um, so you can, I can learn things like that. Um, I can learn about when the sun sets and when it rises, which is really important in a city as far north as London or um, a city that's not at my um, latitude. Use those sorts of resources and just gobble them up, take them all in. Uh, really, this is six months of just eating words and images as well. Um, 
So again, when you go to the library, you're going to get some books to check out, but check with that reference librarian. There are some books that you can use and have access to, but that can't be checked out. These are in the reference section. And that's usually where you're going to find some nice oversized books that have great images in them, books of maps, almanacs, etc. Use that. Use your reference librarian. If libraries are ever open again, oh, please, I want libraries to open again. Um, use those librarians. Now, we live in a time when we have access to other media that can be so helpful. Photo archives, maps, films if possible. I found some really early film footage of London um, <coughs> that um, isn't from Dickens' time, but close enough that I could get a glimpse of what it was like. Um, I was surprised at the number of photographs I found um, from Dickens' time. Great heaving archives of it, uh, much which can be gleaned um, in a library um, and much of which can be gleaned online as well. Those really helped me a lot, helped me to understand how close the buildings were together, what the streets looked like, how crowded it was at a particular place and time. Just that sense of the hustle and the bustle of it all for London or for the quietude that might be found in the Salinas Valley. Um, you have to become omnivorous at this point. Um, now, let me stress for me the importance of maps. A map is a metaphor for the city and having a map of that city or Steinbeck country up above my desk helps me see the whole world of the novel. And it helps me see as I'm writing the novel where the novel's going or where I think it's going. Um, I love one map right above the desk. Then again, whatever visual image you need, but you should be able to find something that you can put above your desk or on your laptop or at your cafe or wherever, um, that represents um, the entire novel in one glance. So you can look up and be reminded of the big picture of it. Um, and plus maps are really fun. So the internet. Listen, I use the internet all the time for research. It's really important. There's a great, so many great resources or resources out there, and you should follow your bliss and follow your maps. But I think you need to be careful with the internet. When I was writing uh, Bridge of Time, which concerns Mark Twain, I found this wonderful Mark Twain quote. Oh, man, it was about cast off and sail away and chase your dreams and all this. It sounded like the end of a high school commencement address. And I thought, oh my God, this is perfect for the novel. I want to use this as the epigraph for the novel. But I was leery and I, I couldn't find a source anywhere. So I kept checking and checking and checking. And the further I checked, the further I checked, what I discovered was somebody at some point attributed this to Mark Twain um, after the internet was invented. And now it just goes around with Mark Twain's name on it. And I would have felt a little silly putting a fake Mark Twain quote in a book about Mark Twain quote. You really need to verify any information that you get off the internet for your own sense of the reality of it, the veracity of it. Did this really happen? <clears throat> Was this really said? You can, also, you can often chase down pieces of data that you find on the internet by following that piece of information until you get to a published source and then checking, is this a real published source? Um, I also like to mix my book research with internet research. I really like to triangulate. I like to find at least three sources um, for a piece of information before I consider including it in a piece of work. Um, it, it's too dangerous to just put up something um, on faith. And again, as you're triangulating, maybe, maybe looking at a published source, maybe looking at an internet source, a combination, um, as you're doing that, you frequently come across surprises. Use the internet. Um, look for printed sources that back it up. Try to triangulate. 
with at least three credible mentions. You researched, you researched six weeks staring out the window, six weeks, six months staring out the window, reading books, carrying them back and forth from the library, taking notes, and now I'm finally ready to start writing my novel. I keep a notebook the whole time. I've got notes and notes of research details. It's all chiming in my head, just turning around. So now what do I do? I'm just about to start writing the novel. So I look at my huge pile of research and I say, goodbye. I'm going to forget you until this novel is done. I think it's really important to not keep the research too close to you while you're writing the actual novel. Let me explain. You have, through all of your research, gleaned and understood the deepest, most important aspects of the historical era that you're writing about. That is all sunk in and deep within you. Now you need to have some faith in yourself, have faith that the, that the most important things have in, in fact settled into you, and then you wanna put the research away. The issue is that if the research is right there and you come across a detail and you're a little, then you get back into the research and you're overwhelmed by it again. And you're just checking detail after detail. The good news is that once all of this information has been gleaned um, and it has sunk into you, um, you write the novel um, using your best intuition, your informed instincts, and then you can go back in the many drafts that are going to follow and verify and rectify and clarify any of the research, put in the right detail. Um, and the reason I think this is important is that research can overwhelm a novel. The place can be filled up with too many chairs and architectural details and snuff boxes and whatever. Um, and we lose track of the character. I like to be focused on the character and moving that character through the world when I'm writing and not be looking over my shoulder constantly saying, oh, man, man would they really drink tea at this hour of the day? Hmm. Do all that research, build that world in your head, put it into motion in your head, and then put all the research away. You can always come back to it. Don't let the research get in the way of the characters. A note, and this is just a fun story uh, about the overwhelming quality of research um, or the, 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 the quality of research, the quantity of research that can be overwhelming. Um, John Irving, the novelist, um, is a great researcher, um, absolutely meticulous and comprehensive. But he also understands that there's a limit to it. Um, when he was writing a novel called The Son of the Circus, which is about Indian circuses, um, um, East Indian circuses, um, he had done a, he had lived in, in India for a while, done a ton of research there, et cetera. But he, as he was writing the novel and finishing it, he came across one piece of information about the world and he, need, he knew he needed to do some more on-site researching. So he flew to India. He knew that India would be really overwhelming. So when he got off of the plane, he stepped out of the airport, put a jacket over his head, got into a taxi, told the driver where to go. They went to the place he needed to research. He did his research in this one small room got back in the cab and went back. He could not let all of that information get in there. Uh, I love that. And in my, in, in my own case, and, and this, is, this, this is something that, that really needs to be kept in mind. Use, from your research, use what is important to the novel and don't feel obligated to use everything you discovered, no matter how interesting it is. Use what the characters in the story need. When I was writing The Haunting of Charles Dickens I, and doing a lot of research, I came across this wonderful street in uh, London um, back during Dickens' time called Garlic Hill. 
G-A-R-L-I-C-K, Garlic Hill. And it was known, the street was known as Garlic Hill because it was the home of all the different garlic vendors in London. It was a street that's where half of the shops sold garlic, all varieties of garlic. And I was fascinated by this. All these different types of garlic, and there was this elephant garlic, and there was this wild garlic. Anyway, and the, all of these different purveyors and all this competition, I thought, oh, this is wonderful. So I had my characters, Charles Dickens and uh, Meg Pickle, um, I had them uh, walk down Garlic Hill for three pages while I told you all about uh, the history of garlic and all of these shops. And, well, frankly, um, nobody cared. Um, well, my editor certainly didn't care. And she pointed out um, how silly I'd been. And so I took out, there's not a mention of Garlic Hill. You have to be willing to discard a lot of things. And you have to understand what are the most important things for you to keep. Forgetting your research while you're composing allows you to focus on the stories and the characters. And it allows you to put them into motion to make the lost world brand new again. So we have a few minutes left. <clears throat> I'm going to read um, and talk about a couple of examples from some of my books, because why not? Um, I'm going to start with Steinbeck's Ghost which again is a contemporary novel, but has some sort of magical realist flashbacks to Steinbeck's era, the 30s, and even earlier um, around 1900, um, where a, a horrible race-motivated lynching, I guess all lynchings are race-motivated, um, takes place. Um, I talked about the bike ride. So I'm gonna talk, a, I'm gonna read a little passage from the bike ride here. Um, and I hope you can see what I've done. I want to talk about, I'll stop and talk about a few things. So this is uh, Travis trying to, uh, the main character, trying to ride his bike uh, across the valley. As soon as school let out, Travis zipped from Bella Linda Terrace into Old Town, then down Main Street, which he followed out of town, where it turned into Highway 68, the road that led to Monterey and the ocean. As soon as he cleared the last houses and shops, the vast, flat, Salinas Valley spread out before him a hundred miles south, nothing but acres of corporate farmland. The land was so fertile and its produce so abundant, Steinbeck called it the valley of the world. The strong sense of soil and manure were a cloud around Travis as he rode. In one of the fields, giant wooden farm workers painted in bright colors and shown at their tasks stood guard. Behind them, Real farm workers, identical to their oversized wooden counterparts, worked up and down rows of iceberg lettuce. The wooden cutouts of the farm workers seemed like an insult to the real workers. The wooden figures were all smiling, and Travis was certain that the real farm workers behind them were not. So I do include a bunch of exposition in this, but I tried to keep it all through Travis. So the route um, from Bellwood Terrace, Old Sound, the Main Street, and it gets to 68, et cetera. That's the, that's the route that he's mapped in his head and to understand how he's going to get there. And then, of course, I bring in all of these sensations around him. I try to, uh, the cloud of manure around him, his vista of this vast corporate flatlands of agriculture. And then finally, this last thing, um, which is just a, is a real contemporary moment. They have these giant wooden uh, cutouts of farm workers, which seem really shameful, planted right in the in the fields where people are working. Um, I tried to keep it as much as I could wrapped around Travis. I tried to keep the bike ride as short as possible, and I used names, proper names, to give it texture instead of describing every street. Um, this is a trick a lot of writers use, and it's pretty faithful. Richard Ford has a book of stories called Men Without Women, I think, and they all take place in Paris. He never use, he never really describes Paris. He just uses the names, the proper names of the streets, and the texture of those proper names starts to build pictures and images in a reader's head. And so here it's Bella Linda Terrace, then Old Town, then Main Street, then Highway 68. On those textured things, 
we begin to build our picture. Ah, one little example there. And now I want to read um, from, uh, oh yeah, uh, from The Hunting of Charles Dickens. Uh, Meg Pickle and her family are, uh, Meg Pickle's 12, and uh, her family are a family of printers. They own a print shop and they live above the print shop. Um, and so all of this information about, I wanted to get across information about how things were printed in the 19th century. And so by having them, Meg and her family be printers, this is information that they already owned up inside of them. And so I didn't have to stop too often to describe it. And again, tried to use other senses to keep it in motion. Here's a little bit on this. Meg finally decided on an unnamed typeface that was plain and blocky. There were no flourishes on this type, no serifs. The lines of it were thick, nearly half an inch across for each leg of the letter H. The type did not whisper, it screamed, and what it screamed was, pay attention. She chose, chose two large composing sticks and set the letters in them. She tightened the composing sticks so the letters were flesh and straight, compacted. She showed the composing sticks to her father. The mechanic, he carefully measured them, eyed them from far away, poured over them closely. He nodded his best nod, his unmistakable signal, perfect. Close was not good enough in printing, only perfection would do. Her father had found stars in the odd sorts cases. There were a number of five-pointed stars, regular and symmetrical, each one about a quarter inch across. Then there were seven exploded stars, each with nine points of varying lengths. These were almost a half inch across. They're beautiful, Meg said. Let's use these. They're dynamic. So again, I tried to keep the information within the character's senses, perceptions, knowing. Always tie it to the character. We only read for character. And now, Last, a little bit from Bridge of Time. So Joan Lee and Lee Joan Jones are um, eighth graders. They're best friends who live in San Francisco. They've gone on a field trip to Fort Point, a very disappointing field trip. They've fallen asleep in the lighthouse that they snuck into on the top of Fort Point, and they've woken up, and the Golden Gate Bridge is not there. The Golden Gate Bridge was not where it was supposed to be, and no earthquake had pulled it down. There was no rubble in the water where the bridge had once stood. There was simply no bridge. Lee and Joan did the only thing they could possibly do. They stared, no thinking, just staring. A loud pop and rumble shook the lighthouse's tower. The noise came from behind them and they rushed to it. A small white cloud hung above one of the cannons on the barbette tier. Cannons? Joan asked herself. There were no cannons on top of the fort. Any field tripper knew that. All the cannons were in the main courtyard, plugged with concrete. Fact. Three soldiers were busy reloading the cannon, their uniforms pale blue against the bright green grass. Grass? There was no grass on the barbette tier. It was all asphalt. Joan knew this for another fact. How weird that she should be taking notice of the grass. Shouldn't she be more concerned about the soldiers? So again, here, Joan is using some uh, really definite exposition um, vocabulary about the fort. Um, the barbet tier is what it's called, the top of the fort. Um, so how does that keep it in motion? Well, Joan is an absolute brainiac and determined to have a 4.7 for the rest of her life, and she memorizes everything. And she's been on this field trip 100 times. I keep the motion, I keep the history in motion through the characters thinking about it. And then I add the smoke, the green grass, the pop, the clang. I add those sensual details to try and make the whole thing feel more alive. I don't know if I've succeeded, but I really, really had fun writing all three of those. Thank you everybody for coming today. Um, lovely to have you here. Vote, participate, donate, be active. Um, and I'm always happy to hear from readers. Um, 
or fellow writers, um, you can go to my website, lewisbusby.com. I put it in the chat over here. Um, I'm always happy to hear from you if you have any more questions or want to just want to talk about it. Um, go to lewisbusby.com, look at the contact button, and uh, hit me up. Thanks, everybody. Um, boy, take care. <laughs>